Hi, good morning. Happy Tuesday. Um, today we're going to read Acts chapter 6. It's 1 through 15. It's actually the whole chapter. It's kind of a short chapter, so I figure we might as well go ahead and read the whole thing. Um, in this chapter, we're going to see the first time that the structure of the church is sort of being solidified. So especially the hierarchy. So like what are the various roles in the leadership of the church? And so one of those roles is deacons. And so we're actually going to see the emergence of deacons here in chapter six. So let's pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning with our intentions and our needs we place them in your hands. We ask that you would calm our hearts and our minds. Give us your peace. Help us to know that you are with us here in this room, in this place, and even in our own heart. Jesus, help us to recognize you in our own self. Um, help us to recognize you in the people around us. Help us to recognize you um, even just in all of space and all of time. We ask that you would reveal to us your purpose, um, reveal to us the meaning of the church, what it is to be a part of that, and we ask all of these things in your name as we pray. At that time, as the number of disciples continued to grow, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So the twelve called together the community of the disciples and said, It is not right for us to neglect the word of God to serve at table. Brothers, select from among you seven reputable men, filled with the spirit and wisdom, whom we shall appoint to this task, whereas we shall devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The proposal was acceptable to the whole community, so they chose Stephen, a man filled with faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid hands on them. The word of God continued to spread, and the number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. Even a large group of priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, filled with grace and power, was working great wonders and signs among the people. Certain members of the so-called synagogue of freedmen, Cyrenians and Alexandrians, people from Cilicia and Asia, came forward and debated with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they instigated some men to say, We have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, accosted him, seized him, and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They presented false witnesses who testified, This man never stopped saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him claim that this Jesus, the Nazarene, will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. All those who sat in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him, and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so this is about the deacons. So a couple things I want to point out. Um, the first thing is like, why did we need deacons? Like, what was the purpose of these deacons? Okay, so in the beginning, it says that the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So what does that mean? So the Hellenists are the Greeks. Okay, the Hellenists are the people that are not Jews. Um, the, all of these people are Christians that we're talking about. So the Hellenists and the Hebrews and the widows, like they're all Christian. Um, but the Hellenists are Greek Christians, those Christians that were Gentiles who converted to Christianity. Um, and then the Hebrews are the Christians who converted from Judaism. Okay, so Hebrews are former Jews and the Hellenists are former Greeks. Okay. So what's happening is within the church, there's some tension because before, remember, the Jews were the chosen people. They were the ones who kind of were like huddling together, like they were their own people. They were the ones chosen by God. But the Greeks were like apart from them. They weren't a part of that religion. They weren't a part of that nationality. They weren't a part of that really family of God, if you want to 
uh, look at it that way. Okay, so they were used to being kind of against each other. They were used to being like there was a divide between them, but now they're all in the same church, right? Because now we have the universal church. And so they're all brought together. So this is causing some rifts, causing some problems. They're kind of having to learn how to be a family, right? Um, and so this is uh, the problem that comes about is that widows who in this time are not usually taken care of. So like typically if you're a widow, like, you're kind of destitute unless you can get yourself married again, right? And so it's kind of hard for people like that. They're in poverty. So they need people to actually care for them. Well, in the Christian community, remember, we read about yesterday or two days ago, I guess, that um, the Christian community is supposed to be giving money to each other in order that they all can be provided for and all cared for, right? And so what's happening, it says, is that the Greek widows or the Greeks are complaining against the Jews, the Hebrews, because the Greek widows are being neglected in the daily distribution, like the distribution of money, right? So um, so basically saying like how they respond is the disciples, the, the apostles, the ones who are, are priests and, and bishops basically at this point, are going out and preaching the gospel and they're like, we don't have time to like oversee the daily distribution of goods and like making sure that everybody has everything, like enough food and all of that. They're like, we have to be going out and preaching the gospel. So we need other people who are part of this ministry who can preach the gospel, but who also can devote their time to the kind of inner workings of the church and make sure that the people who are the poorest in our community are cared for. And so those are going to be the deacons, right? And so that, that's when they elect to be certain men. It says these reputable men who are acceptable to the whole community, the apostles choose them, right? So the community brings them to the apostles. The apostles say, okay, we accept these guys, right? And then it says the apostles laid hands on them, right? So this is a symbol of the conferral of authority, right? So they lay hands on these men and they're ordained to the diaconate, okay? What's really cool is that you see the same thing happen today. If you go to the ordination of a deacon or a priest or a bishop, you see the bishop lay hands on this man in order to ordain him, right? And now he has a particular role, a particular task um, to play in the church. Okay, so um, so then it says that that was a good solution to the problem. So then the deacons could go out and they could care for these widows, make sure that everybody was getting their due and what they needed to survive, and then they can continue to preach the word as they do that. So it's a very particular ministry. So today in the church, you see the deacons um, in mass, you would see them preaching uh, the gospel and possibly saying a homily. So whenever there's a deacon present at mass, the deacon will read the gospel always. Um, but then sometimes the priest will preach and sometimes the deacon will preach. So the deacon does have a ministry of preaching. But then also deacons are typically the ones who are taking communion to the people at home who are homebound. Um, obviously right now we're all homebound and so we don't have enough deacons to be able to do that safely, right? And so we're not doing that. But normally when everybody else is going to Mass on Sunday, the deacon can take the Eucharist in what's called a pix. It's like this little um, like golden box. And he can take the Eucharist to shut-ins, people who can't physically get to Mass and distribute the Eucharist. So that's one thing. Um, but then also deacons a lot of times are involved in various ministries throughout the church where they're just, they're helping. They're serving the poor. They're running various ministries in the parish. They're doing all sorts of things that allow the priest to focus on the sacraments, right? The focus on the Masses, to focus focus on the anointings of the sick, to focus on confessions, to f focus on all of those sacraments that they do, okay? All right, so they're basically like these uh, assistants to priests. All right, so Stephen then is one of the deacons that are chosen, or that is chosen. Um, he is particularly filled with grace and power. It says that even in verse 5, a man filled with faith in the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 8, now Stephen, filled with grace and power, was working great wonders and signs among the people. So Stephen is, um, in a particular way, going out, and he's preaching the gospel, and he's healing people, and he's doing all kinds of great things in the church. Um, and some of the people who are not Christian, um, I'm assuming some of the Jews, they go and they instigate some people to basically lie about what Stephen is saying. And they say, um, we have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God, right? Which Stephen's not doing, but they're basically setting him up so that he will be arrested. Okay, and that's exactly what happens. It sounds familiar, right? That's what also happens to Jesus. Um, so there are some like false accusations. Okay, so he's brought before the Sanhedrin, so the Council of the Jews, um, and they present more false witnesses against him. 
um, saying all kinds of things that are not true. Um, and then it says that the Sanhedrin basically were looking intently at him and they noticed that his face was like the face of an angel, whatever that means, right? And so they saw that there was something different about this guy, right? Like maybe he was glowing or something, I'm not sure, but he looked like angelic. He looked like he had been touched by God, right? And so they recognize, right? Even if not explicitly, they recognize that there's something special about this guy, right? That God is actually working through this guy, but they don't like that. And so we're going to read in the next chapter tomorrow about what happens at Stephen's trial because he gives this beautiful speech um, and then eventually is martyred, okay? So um, so we'll talk about that more tomorrow. We'll read through chapter 7 tomorrow, which is a little bit longer, but it kind of talks all about the story of Stephen. And so um, so we'll focus on that, okay? But I just want you to notice that they did notice that his face is like the face of an angel. So they did perceive the truth. It was kind of like Pontius Pilate, right, with Jesus, where Jesus is before Pilate and he's speaking to him, and Pilate is like, there's something different about this guy, right? Like, and I know that he's not guilty of anything that I should be accusing him of, right? Pilate even says to the Jews, I find this man not guilty, right? Like, I don't think that there's anything wrong with this guy. And they're like, crucify him, crucify him, right? And they, he, Pilate bends to their will because of his fear, right? He doesn't want to lose his power. He doesn't want to lose his status and authority. He's afraid of their rebellion. And so he gives them what they want, right? Even though he knows that Jesus is innocent right? So the Sanhedrin do the same thing to Stephen, where they see that Stephen is touched by God in some way, right? They see that he's, he's somewhat angelic, and yet they still continue to persecute him, which we'll see a little bit more tomorrow, okay? So I just want to point that out. So yeah, I think uh, one reflection for us might be, um, first of all, like, how do we sometimes perceive the truth but don't want to admit it or admit that it might be true um, because we're afraid of the consequences of that in our lives, right? Like maybe we're doing something that if a certain thing is true, that means that we need to change the way that we live our lives and that might be difficult. And we don't want to do the difficult thing, so we just pretend like we never saw the truth, right? Um, even if it's just a little glimpse, you know, sometimes we, we feel like this, this very little glimpse of like, this is the truth and it kind of scares us. And so we back away, we pretend like we never heard or saw or recognized anything. Um, and we kind of just sweep it under the rug, but like, we need to recognize that like God speaks in that way, right? He speaks in a still small voice in the whisper and just like the hint, right? And so we have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. We have to be able to be attentive to what the Lord um, is trying to tell us, right? Because again, he speaks in that still small voice. He doesn't yell at us. He doesn't give us this big sign, right? Um, Jesus did a ton of big signs and yet people still didn't believe him, right? But um, those of us who, are, who can quiet our hearts and our minds and we can pray and we can take time every day to sit in the stillness and be with the Lord, be with his word and scripture, right? We're going to be able to perceive when he's working at other times in our lives, okay? So um, it's more important for us to go with the truth, right? That inclination of the truth and to really pursue that. Um, because the Lord is going to bring good from that in the end, right? Even if it's difficult at first, he's going to bring fulfillment. So that's important for us, I think, to remember. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Um, if you have any thoughts, feel free to participate on the Padlet discussion board. You can scroll down until you find Tuesday of this week um, and give us your thoughts. Talk to you later.